bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, and the Holland Blurview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation. We would also like to thank the following Keystone partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. My name is uh, Doug Maynard and I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And today's webinar is titled, uh, Practice Change, It Doesn't Have to Be Painful. All right, so today's, uh, once again, as, uh, as was last week, uh, a great opportunity to bring uh, the, the experts and the leaders from across the CAFC community to share some of the work that they've been doing on CAFC's uh, behalf. And today it's our, one of our communities of practice, this one on children's pain, uh, coming to talk about uh, the work that they've done in developing a toolkit uh, re related to children's pain. Uh, we have, uh, once again, I think I said this a few months ago, we broke a record for the largest panel, but this group, uh, tr in the true sense of community and the community of practice, has broken that record for the largest panel. I think we have nine people that are all going to be handing off and, and, and talking about the different components and pieces of uh, the work that they've uh, they've been leading and and uh, and developing. Um, so we're going to have lots of di a nice dynamic panel with lots of input from across the country. So I'm just going to read some brief bios. All that other information is on about our presenters is on the uh, can on the page. It's on the screen in front of you. But uh, with us today we have uh, Dr. Samina Ali, who is a pediatric emergency physician at the Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta. We have Ashley Townley, a knowledge broker at Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital in Toronto, Ontario. We have Dr. Naveen Punai, a pediatric emergency physician at the Children's Hospital London Health Sciences Centre in London, Ontario. We have Alana Jackson, who is a certified child life specialist at McMaster Children's Hospital in Hamilton, Ontario. We have Kathy Reed, who's a nurse practitioner with the Pediatric Chronic Pain Service at Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta. We have uh, Jerry St. Jean, the, a clinical nurse educator at, at the emergency department at the Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta. We have Jennifer Toole Friedman, who is the medical lead for quality and safety at the Alberta Children's Hospital Emergency Department in Calgary, Alberta. And we have Dr. Evelyn Trache, a pediatric emergency physician at the CHU St. Justine in uh, Montreal, Quebec. So it's my uh, pleasure to hand the virtual po podium over first to Dr. Samina Ali to kick this off. Over to you, Dr. Ali. Thank you very much and good morning. Um, oh, wonderful, thank you so much. All right, and so thank you everyone for joining us. We're very, very excited to have this opportunity to present this uh, work to you. Um, I'd like to begin uh, first by uh, mentioning that there are no conflicts of interest for any of the individuals presenting um, today um, as we are talking about uh, a fair number of medications and products and that uh, the only uh, shared uh, co conflict, if you will, and in this case a, a positive conflict, is that we are all members of the CAP pain community of practice. Our, our objectives today are to talk about um, some, tool, uh, some toolkits um, that we've created as a part of this COP and uh, talk a little bit about um, why pain became a focus for CAFC, um, how we created these toolkits and why we chose to create toolkits in particular because there are many other modalities for knowledge translation. We wanted to then share with you some examples um, of the toolkits and what they look like and follow that with some uh, real life success stories. Some of them will be, uh, the first couple will be stories from the trenches as it were. So some of our community members talking about how they um, allowed for change within their institutions. And then following that, we'll talk about some uh, community-based collaborations across Canada that have been successful in forwarding our mandate um, of uh, improving pain for children in all um, healthcare settings across the nation. So with that, I'll start with um, a story. I'm a little bit of a storyteller for those who know me, so this is a once upon a time of how this community of practice came to exist. So here we go. Um, I'll let you read that. Um, uh, and um, it does say pediatric patients seldom need medication for the relief of pain. They tolerate discomfort well. 
um, I put it um, up there to remind us that not too long ago, um, this was the thought process behind um, child, the, the ignoring uh, or, or minimal treating of children's pain. Um, it was felt that they didn't feel pain, or if they did, they tolerated it well, and that there were no side effects um, to ha or long-term consequences to having this uh, pain untreated. Of course, I think I'm preaching to converted on the call today to say that we all know that this is not the case and that there are significant short and long-term uh, complications and uh, implications to not treating children's pain. So this is where um, our story starts. So why does pain matter? It's the most common reason for seeking health care in the Western world. Um, my world is the emergency department, and in that world we say up to 80% of pediatric presentations are related to pain. Um, further, if you want to go broader than the national mandate, the WHO, or World Health Organization, mandates that optimal pain treatment should be a fundamental human right. So this isn't just the idea of a few, this is the idea internationally of a well-respected organization as well. And um, this idea has been, um, has been uh, reinforced by the American Academy of Pediatrics, Canadian Pain Societies, and many, many other organizations. So why aren't we the champions of pain treatment? Well, we asked um, a couple of years ago a whole lot of Canadian emerg pediatric emergency physicians what was keeping them from being able to provide optimal pain management in tertiary care hospitals. So these are individuals who ostensibly should have access to multiple modalities to treat pain um, at a pediatric centre. And over half of them said, if you look at that table on this page, that a lot of it had to do with lack of time and disruption of flow. And while we, it's beyond our scope to um, affect the lack of time for every clinician across Canada. We're hoping that if we streamline things for them, um, it might make it easier. But if you look at the next couple of concerns they had, they said ed lack of education was an issue. Um, the fourth one there, difficulty quantifying pain, lack of policies and poor policy adherence were issues as well. And those are things that I think we will be able to um, address through our uh, community efforts. The same study, we asked them, what would you need? So if you look at table five, um, what are the ideal changes that would allow you to optimize pain management better? And they said, give us more access to drugs, which can be addressed on a local level. But then they wanted more policy and procedures, more education, um, more pain, improved pain measurement. So again, these are all things that we do think we'll be able to address, and um, we'll show you those shortly. Um, in table six, we asked them in what areas physicians would like more education. And they asked for evidence-based pain management, psychological interventions, uh, pain measurement, protocol implementation. And uh, so this became the background for helping us figure out what uh, we might want to do moving forward as a community. So that was in the pediatric setting. What about the general setting? Because we know that well over half um, to 80% of children when they seek acute care in Canada do not go to a pediatric tertiary care centre. They go to general and community resources um, that are closer in proximity or available to them. So we did a similar study across Alberta and we asked 100 emergency departments what they were doing. And they, again, interestingly, without going through the entire table, when you look at table three, their barriers are very similar. Education, lack of um, standing orders, um, and uh, time constraints. And then they asked again for policies, uh, procedures, and education. So with that in mind, um, we moved forward as a community of practice. And so back in, the, in late 2012, this is where our story begins, this group of really smart people at CAFC, some of whom I'm certain are on this call, um, met um, in 20, uh, late 2012 and talked about what the key priorities should be for CAFC moving forward over the coming years. And um, they chose, much to our, um, uh, our um, much to our happiness, uh, pain as one of the fo focus that, uh, for foci that they'd like to, to, to work on. And so in early 2013, we created a community of practice that revolved around pain. So full disclosure, when I was invited in 2013 to join this community of practice, I said, sure, as soon as I figure out what a community of practice is. So I went forward and actually, I'll be honest, I Google searched it and this is what I found. Um, a community of practice is a group of people who share a concern or a passion for something they do and learn to do it better as they interact regularly. And I really like the second half that said this definition reflects the fundamentally social nature of human learning. 
So that was very appealing um, to me as a, as a way to approach um, a challenge that many, many, many of us were facing administratively, in our research lives, in our clinical lives, and probably as um, community members, as parents or, or advocates for our, our friends and loved ones. So this pain COP came together and its goal was to improve healthcare pain practices quality and safety and efficiency by building a national collaboration and to share ideas and experiences um, across, uh, across the nation. And our target audience simply was all CAFC member institutions with a focus on reaching our non-pediatric focused centers. So in other words, trying to move out of and beyond pediatric tertiary care centers. So first, we figured out that there were three key areas of focus. Pain is a very broad area, as you all know. And so we decided to break this up into sections that we felt we could manage. And so we started with procedural pain, acute pain, and chronic pain as our three areas of focus. And then we chose procedural pain as our first focus. The evidence-based answer for why we went there is that it's a universal problem that's encountered in all settings. There's a mature evidence base. There was a demand from the community for it, and our group, frankly, had a fair bit of expertise in the area of procedural pain. The visceral answer was it was low-hanging fruit, and what I mean by that is that there was so much of a mature evidence base that had yet to translate into practice that it was the easiest place to begin. So we started off with two surveys. Um, of the CAFC community to, dis to determine and confirm that their current practice, knowledge gaps, and barriers were congruent with what the literature had shown us, and in fact, it they were. Um, they, we then, um, our COP members decided that a compendium of best practice resources would be what was most likely to be helpful for our community. And so we began uh, looking at and appraising relevant systematic reviews. Um, so a very broad um, search of the Cochrane database of systematic reviews with very broad search terms yielded about 25 Cochrane reviews, which we then honed down, reviewed as a group, and decided that there were seven key areas that had um, robust um, evidence that we would move forward to look at. So uh, interventions with robust evidence were pain assessment in children, um, and we decided to create this as, a, as um, a focus because we recognized, all of us within this community, that if you don't measure pain, um, it's harder to treat it and to measure effectiveness or to know that you've, uh, you've had an effect on your patient. So pain assessment, oral sucrose, topical anesthetics for venipuncture, pain minimizing techniques for laceration repair, distraction techniques, um, breastfeeding, positioning, and non-nutritive sucking, and then in parentheses, intranasal fentanyl use. And if you're wondering about the parentheses, it's because we've all recognized that the, the evidence base was not as robust for intranasal fentanyl, but universally our CAFC community indicated um, that the majority of them, not universally, but the, but the majority of them were using intranasal fentanyl for managing um, pain and small procedures. And so they wanted more information about how to do this in the safest way. So we decided to create and collect content which included policy examples, educational presentations, family resources, videos, background articles, and other implementation tools. And the idea behind this was, quite simply, if I was sitting in my, in my healthcare setting in the community um, and I decided that I was I had recognized that oral sucrose was something that was important and that worked, and I wanted to implement it broadly within my center. How could I do this most effectively without having to go many places to find the information? Alternatively, it could also be used, for instance, if I wanted to use one of these techniques in my personal practice and wanted to confirm that I had the right dosing and the right um, indications for it. So it can be used on a scaled-down personal level, but has all the tools there that if you get really excited about it and you want to um, help your institution or your clinical setting um, implement this as a policy, the pieces would be there. So we then had seven uh, community of practice clinical experts who partnered with um, the two co-chairs of this community of practice, myself and Ashley Townley, to assess the relevance and quality of the content and create these e-toolkits. 
And so with no further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Uh, sorry, to, uh, to Ashley Townley so she can tell you about uh, what these e-toolkits are and why we chose that as our uh, mechanism for relaying this information. That's great. Thanks, Samina. Um, so as Doug mentioned in the beginning, my name is Ashley Townley and I work at Holland Bloorview Kids Rehab Hospital in Toronto and I'm the co-chair of the Pain COP with Samina. I work for a team called Evidence to Care and uh, we are the knowledge translation hub at our hospital. Our job is to take the best available research evidence from the pages of journal articles and work with clinicians to turn it into the best care possible for children with disabilities. So, further to that, in addition to the evidence that um, Samina presented about the prevalence of children's acute procedural pain and the impetus for this project, why else would our COP pursue a project like this? Well, it's because recent literature indicates that it takes approximately 17 years for new evidence-based findings to reach clinical practice. And even after 17 years, only 14% of new scientific discoveries are expected to enter day-to-day -day practice. Interestingly, 17 years is how long it takes for research just to reach clinical care. For new evidence to go from inception to day-to-day -day practice, and I mean practice that isn't part of a new practice change initiative, it can take upwards of 20 to 30 years to be used in daily practice. When you think about it, these statistics are somewhat scary, especially when the number of publications in peer-reviewed journal articles continues to grow. Estimates produced in 2006, which is mid admittedly probably out of date right now, and we can assume that it's, it's about the same or possibly more, suggest that there is 1.35 million articles being published within that year alone, and it will continue to grow. So what can we do about it? This is where the field of knowledge translation, or as you may have heard of it, knowledge mobilization or knowledge exchange among possible other labels, um, this is where it comes in. Knowledge translation, or KT for short, is quite the buzzword these days. You may have heard it around your organization. Regardless of what you call it, knowledge translation is about bringing the right information in the right format to the right people at the right time to optimize health and aim to reduce that 20 to 30 year gap from known best practice to daily clinical practice. For this CAPC pain COP, to get the right information in the right format to the right people, we landed on a toolkit format like Samina spoke about. A toolkit specifically is a package of multiple tools and strategies that systematize tangible and usable knowledge products. For example, things like templates, pocket card guidelines, algorithms, um, and other things, for example. The goal is for the user to select the strategy in the toolkit that is best supported by the evidence and then use it at their own discretion according to what their goals are, their access to resources, and their context. Given the CAPC context, uh, context as a national organization with many members that differ in size, differ in location, and differ in the populations they serve, these electronic toolkits offered us the opportunity to address the three pillars of evidence-based decision-making. Our pain COP provided the research evidence. Our seven clinical experts and the broader COP gave their experiential evidence by providing us with their years of clinical expertise and providing us resources that make up the recommendations and other tangible tools in the toolkit. And um, the contextual evidence will come from the organizations that choose to use these toolboxes and modify them to make sense where they are. So I'm just going to touch briefly on the KT goals, audience strategies, and impact measurements of the toolkit. So the goal of these toolkits is to get the best research about acute procedural pain into the hands of those busy clinicians who see kids in their organizations. We wanted to move the recommendations off the pages of the systematic review and give clinicians practical resources to implement them in clinic for their use or even hopefully at an organizational level. With CAPC's national reach, this organization is well positioned in the healthcare system to do just that to access their membership and support broader dissemination than any one clinician or hospital could possibly achieve. Our audiences um, are primarily the CAPC member institutions and clinicians with a focus on reaching non-pediatric centers. As a secondary audience, we have included family and patient resources where applicable for you to use and um, share widely. 
Uh, and you'll see these shortly when we review the toolkits. Ultimately, to move this content forward, our strategy um, was to create a web-based, open access, and easy-to-use easy product, which ultimately was the toolbox, or sorry, toolkit. Just as we look to the literature and to the clinical expertise of our colleagues for acute procedural pain, we also look to the literature to support this pro product format. A recent systematic review by Yamada and colleagues found that 39 studies um, that looked at the effectiveness of toolkits as a knowledge translation strategy found that eight papers indicated there was some effectiveness for clinical change. Now, some of these studies um, looked at using the toolkit as only one strategy to disseminate the information, and some included the toolkit along with another strategy. So, for example, the toolkit being implemented in combination with an educational outreach or resource. Other literature we looked at included the effectiveness of different KT strategies, many of which have an active component to them. So, for example, education, interprofessional collaboration, or they included a combination. So like I mentioned, a toolkit and an education strategy. Currently, there is mixed evidence to suggest that using more than one KT strategy improves clinical change, but the field of KT is young, so this evidence, in combination with the CAPC national context, made the electronic toolkit the best option for addressing acute procedural pain. So, um, before we, uh, just briefly, as part of my role at Holland Blurview, um, I have worked with our team to develop two, two toolkits, one on pediatric chronic pain, which we've implemented at the front lines at Holland Blurview, and the other on peer support. Both have been successfully, um, both have been successful and highly downloaded internationally as they are freely available online. We had positive evaluation outcomes with one clinician at Holland Blurview stating that the chronic pain toolbox allows us to gather information more systematically and ensure that it happens for every client in the same thorough way. However, one challenge is that the impact of these interventions, like toolkits, can be hard to assess if you don't have direct access to the people using them like we did, and especially for open access resources on a website. So to that point, to address the impact of uh, this CAPC toolkit resource, it is important and it is difficult. It requires resources and it requires time. So based on the capacity of CAPC and our pain COP, the KT plan for the toolbox will be a multi-strategy approach. Through the use of the CAPC Knowledge Exchange Network and other evidence-based product repositories, uh, targeted invitation letters, social media, and listservs, and also leveraging the CAPC web platform like we are now, the toolkits will be made widely available to the healthcare community across Canada. We will track the metrics that are readily available to us, and we are open to future opportunities to assess impact more in depth with our CAPC member organizations. Last but not least, I would like to mention the implementation toolkit that sits within these acute procedural pain toolkits. The pain COP recognized that it can be hard to know where to start in implementing clinical changes. We provided this toolkit with practical case studies of pain change work on the ground and other useful KT literature to support you to move these into practice for yourself or at an organizational level. So with that, I'm going to move on to the uh, next portion of our uh, webinar, and um, we are going to hear about um, some exemplars of toolkits um, from two of our co-leads. Um, so first will be about the assessment toolkit from Naveen, and second will be distraction from Alana. So I'll turn it over to you, Naveen. Okay, thank you very much, Ashley. Um, hello and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very, very excited to talk about pain assessment in children. It's actually one of my uh, special areas of interest. I think it's absolutely fascinating that you can, you know, uh, very easily determine how much pain an adult is in just by asking one question. But in children, you really have to tailor that to the child's age and cognitive level. So let's uh, jump right in here. Um, so there are many, many uh, tools used to measure pain in children. And what I've tried to do uh, for this webinar is to distill down some of that information and just uh, enable uh, clinicians to maybe use, you know, three or four scales that they're very comfortable with in an effort to maximize the uptake and the use of these uh, tools. So let's uh, have a look at a case here. 
five-year-old male with a toothache, uh, how do we measure his pain? Well, the face's pain scale, as you see depicted uh, below, is probably the most appropriate. And it's really important that you phrase the question, you ask the child to point to the face to show how much you hurt right now. Although we all know that's not a, a particularly grammatically correct statement, uh, children that are very young in the four to five age group in which this uh, scale is uh, validated for, so four or five and up, um, may not really understand the word pain, but they will understand the word hurt. And it's important that it's measured at, at the time and, and it's the child that answers, not the parent. The World Health Organization and the American Academy of Pediatrics do recommend treating pain as rated a four or greater. And our goal is really to get pain below the level of a four. When we're looking at older kids, like for example, this 15-year-old uh, female with a forearm fracture, sometimes kids that are you know, 12 and up may feel a little bit awkward pointing to a face. And in this case, a numerical rating scale rated from 0 to 10 is probably the most appropriate. I've put an example of one of these numerical rating scales down below. But in practice, you can actually just uh, ask the uh, child to list a number from 0 to 10 rather than actually show them uh, a scale. It's really important to know that children must be able to understand numbers and understand the meaning of a sequence of numbers. In other words, that an eight is greater than a six. So children that are four and under may not really be able to understand this, as well as even kids seven or eight may not really be able to conceptualize this. And it's very important to know that kids that are cognitively impaired may not be able to understand this as well. And just as a recap, the, uh, uh, both the WHO and the AAP do recommend treating pain rated as uh, four or greater. So let's uh, go down in uh, years here. The five-month-old undergoing IV insertion, we all know that that's a very painful procedure. In these kids, they really can't point to a number, and they certainly can't point to a face, and they don't understand uh, on numbers at all. So basically, these uh, children, their pain is measured by an outside observer, such as a nurse, a physician, or a child life uh, specialist. And the FLAC scale is one of these tools that can be used. So this is an observational tool among the many other observational tools that have been published for acute pain. And these really can be used from you know very early infancy right up to school age. And importantly, this can also be used for cognitively impaired children. This is an example of how the FLAC scale is used. I've just put it out there. It's uh, face, legs, activity, cry, and consolability. So that's the uh, words for the acronym FLAX. And the uh, scale is uh, scored essentially from 0 to 2 for each of these categories, and then the numbers are added up. So just in summary, you know, behavioral rating scales such as FLAC and CHEOPS as well are useful for preverbal and cognitively impaired children when you get a little older, the FACES pain scale revised can actually be used from early school age to probably about age in not, on 9 or 10 when the numerical reading scales are probably way more appropriate. Um, but it's very important to know that in the healthcare setting, uh, pain should be measured regularly and routinely, uh, not just when they arrive to the ED or the hospital, but also by the EMS providers at triage and then reassessed frequently by the nurse, the physician, and the caregiver. What I'm going to do right now is uh, walk you through the pain assessment toolkit. So it can be accessed, all of the toolkits can be accessed uh, using the link. And we can see that uh, all of the toolkits are listed here. Uh, and Right below the evidence summaries, you can identify all of the various toolkits. I'm just going to open up the pain assessment uh, toolkit, which I just talked about there. A very clear icon there. And basically, the assessment toolkit goes over a general summary, including its contents. And there's some very easy links here to the overview of pain assessment tools, a pain assessment flowchart that will allow a logical uh, decision making as to which uh, tool to use for pain assessment. And importantly, there's a PowerPoint uh, presentation here that you can feel free to download and modify 
as you see fit in your clinical setting. So I'm just going to pass it off back to you, uh, Ashley. Thanks, Naveen. So up next, we actually have um, Ilana, um, who will be presenting on the Distraction Toolbox, and will walk you through um, some of the content there as well. Thanks. Hi, everyone. This is Alana Jackson. I'm a Certified Child Life Specialist at McMaster Children's Hospital. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you and presenting this information. I was the co-lead on the Distraction Toolkit for our Committee of Practice. Um, so my role today, I'm going to be talking um, to my experience working in the pediatric emergency department and how, use, how I use planned distraction to support patients and families during distressing and painful procedures and giving some examples through case studies of how you could implement these strategies in your own practice. So what is distraction? Distraction is the purposeful use of a planned alternate focus during a painful or distressing procedure. And what we do with distraction is we can use it to create a more positive experience and also offer a child or adolescent more control in an appropriate way over a specific aspect of the procedure. Um, to give a little bit of background on the use of distraction, it is well supported in the literature. Um, so here I'm going to present just briefly some information from the Cochrane Review. The um, citation is listed down there at the bottom of the screen. And the Cochrane Review included 39 trials looking at various psychological interventions for needle-related procedural pain. So these interventions included distraction as well as hypnosis, coping skills training, preparation, and virtual reality. And psychological interventions aim to help individuals develop and use coping skills to manage pain and distress during procedures. Uh, this specific Cochrane review, the studies um, that were included were 39 randomized control trials that had at least uh, five participants or more. Um, and participants were between the ages of two and 19, although um, the most strongest evidence um, was for participants under the age of 12. Um, so as I said, many of the studies were looking at various um, psychological interventions and 19 trials were specifically looking at distraction only. So this included things such as listening to music during a procedure, watching a cartoon, or having the opportunity to select choice of a toy or a TV show, etc. Um, and the review reports that there um, is a significant effect of distraction on measures of self-reported pain. So children reported that they perceived less pain during procedures through the use of distraction. And I wanted to briefly highlight here as well um, that the review discusses the need for more research on the efficacy of using preparation. So um, explaining procedures in a systematic way to children and families prior to the start of that procedure. Um, although anecdotally in my own work with children, um, I find that preparation is crucial to helping kids understand the purpose of a procedure and to help them um, think about and develop coping strategies to use during that procedure. So what I'm going to discuss now is two case examples looking at how you can use distraction in a purposeful way with patients and families um, in various settings. I'm going to be speaking more specifically, though, to my own experience working in the emergency department. So the first case example I'm going to present is of Anya, three-year-old who presented to the ER with a two centimeter lack on her right knee. And I met with Anya and her dad who had accompanied her to the ER. And the first step that I take is building rapport with patient and family. And it seems like something that can be very time consuming in a fast paced setting, whether you're working in an ER or in primary care. But what I found in my experience is that taking um, that bit of time to build rapport and to discuss the procedure with the patient and the family sets them up for success and allows them to uh, have better cooperation and comfort during the procedure. Um, and then the procedure, of course, can um, happen a lot more quickly and successfully as well. So during that assessment and rapport building, I talked with Anya and her father about past experiences, hospital visits, and Anya's coping style. Um, and through this discussion, learned that Anya had never been to hospital before, um, that she tends to cope well for doctor's visits and dental um, appointments, and her coping style was more of an active one. So she likes getting a lot of information, and she likes to be able to participate in um, that information as well. So Anya and I talked about the reason for um, her laceration repair. She was going to be getting sutures, 
I showed her some of the equipment that would be used. We talked about the steps of the procedure. I offered choices for distraction during the procedure, and um, Anya picked a look and find book. Um, I helped to facilitate uh, comfort positioning with Anya sitting uh, straddled on dad's lap for the procedure. And the book was sort of propped over her lap because Anya didn't want to be looking at the laceration repair. So um, the roles uh, for the procedure were determined. Dad was going to be Anya's distraction coach, and he guided her to look at the book during the procedure and encouraged her engagement with the book. Um, and I was there to provide some extra support um, to help coach Anya during the procedure, remind her to um, participate in her planned alternate focus. So those were the steps for Anya. And I'm going to talk now to using distraction for an older child. Um, so the example I have here is Colton. He was a 14-year-old. He presented to the ER um, with the history of two-day migraine. And he was going to require some IV therapy to treat his um, headache. So when I met with Colton and his family, he was accompanied to the ER by mom. He was sitting in a dark room. He was obviously complaining of headache, um, light sensitivity. Um, he had never had an IV before, but he'd had blood work in the past. So we talked about the steps of an IV and how it's different than having blood work and what some of the similarities are. He had more of an avoidant coping style, so he wanted some information, um, but he didn't want to see any of the equipment um, in that discussion, so as part of the preparation. We talked about a coping plan, what's been helpful for him in the past, um, for instance, when he's had blood work, and he talked about, you know, distraction was something that he identified was helpful, you know, talking about something else. Um, and during the discussion, I noticed he was wearing a Minecraft t-shirt and we got into a conversation about that for some extra rapport building and he was a huge Minecraft fan. And what we ended up doing for um, his planned distraction for the procedure was visualization. And what I mean by that is as um, Colton's distraction coach, I helped to um, have him walk through in his mind his um, the world that he had created in Minecraft. So giving him prompts and questions. Um, different sensory descriptions of what he was seeing in his Minecraft game. Um, and in terms of the roles during that procedure, um, Mama had shared that she was quite fearful of needles, and so she stepped out during the procedure. I stayed in as a child life specialist to provide support, and the nurse as well, who was inserting the IV for Colton. So that's a very quick and brief um, example of how I would use distraction, uh, both for a younger child and for a teenager as well. Um, I think the key pieces here are to assess coping style, past experiences, asking kids and families, you know, what's been helpful in the past, what hasn't been helpful, and really giving them a choice and allowing them the opportunity to pick for themselves what they think is going to be an effective distraction because that's going to um, increase their buy-in and their enjoyment of the distraction during the procedure. Um, I have this slide up here that I wanted to um, throw up just to have some examples because I recognize that um, people who are tuning into this webinar are working in a variety of settings. And I recognize that sometimes we're limited by time and resources in terms of what we're able to provide for distraction, for instance, um, in our clinical settings. But there's lots of different ways that distraction can be incorporated that take very little time, money, um, or resources to implement. So there's some ideas that I will uh, leave up there. And I encourage you to develop your own um, distraction techniques and strategies that are quick and easy to implement. Um, what we're going to do now, um, as Naveen did, I'm going to walk you through the distraction toolkit. So I'm going to pull this up on the screen here. So here's the introduction to the toolkit. And I will be scrolling down to the distraction toolkit right over here. So we have a summary, a list of the contents. And we have a really lovely toolkit here with resources to provide for families, clinical resources, policies. There's a PowerPoint that you're welcome to use for your own institutional use. There's a slide deck that you can modify the slides. And then some videos here as well that are appropriate both for clinicians and for um, to share with families. So some of the um, resources that I wanted to highlight, this is a coping strategies for painful procedures overview. It talks about how to use distraction effectively with some tips, um, how to introduce relaxation techniques and diaphragmatic breathing to patients. And then there's some examples down here of recommended distraction techniques and items by age. Another document we have here from BC Children's Hospital is a hospital policy about incorporating psychological interventions, including preparation and distraction into a procedure, how to do that in a planned and purposeful way, and how to debrief afterwards um, to improve uh, the use of distraction and coping strategies both for the patient, the family, and the healthcare team. 
And then finally, I wanted to highlight um, a PowerPoint that we have here that's available um, that walks you through how to introduce distraction into your setting and give some examples of visuals to use, breathing techniques. And then um, I wanted to give a shout out to my colleagues who helped me take these photos in different comfort positions. So thank you to them. That's me over there in the red shirt. Um, so that's all I have for my presentation. I'm going to pass it back over to the next speaker now. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I'm just getting um, some slides here up on the screen. And um, I think there has been some technical difficulties over at um, Alberta Health Services um, with uh, their, their, um, their computer system. So um, instead of actually having Kathy and Jerry walk through some local success stories, um, Samina has very kindly um, offered to go over them as she, she knows them quite well as well. So at this point, um, I'm going to turn it back over to my co-chair Samina and you can tell us a little bit more about some local success stories. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, so, Ashley, if it's all right with you, um, where uh, you've got your screen up, maybe I'll just ask you to um, forward the slides if that's all right. Sure. No so, okay, great. So, um, let's talk about two stories. They both happen to be from Alberta, which unfortunately has its network down today. Um, and um, our two colleagues who are going to speak to it are unable to join us. But uh, I will speak to um, first uh, Kathy's story, if that's all right. So we'll move forward one slide, please. I am here. Oh, Kathy, wonderful. Please take it over. Okay, I just put these on. <laughs> oh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kathy Reed, and I'm a nurse practitioner here at the Stollery. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we used um, knowledge translation to improve our max lane use here at the Stollery. Next slide, please. I hope you're seeing it because I can't see the webinar. Um, actually, so uh, actually, if you just uh, click on the center of the of the slide, it'll bring that forward. Yeah, there you go. Now, now you should be able to advance it. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> Is it there? Sorry, guys, I can't see the slide because yes, the network doesn't work. Um, yes, Kathy, go ahead. Um, right now, we're on the slide that says using KT to improve maxoline. Thank you. Can you go to the next slide, please? So what we did here was we used Dr. Bonnie Stevens' work that looked at how many needles, and this was published in 2011, and as you can see, 78% of children in our Canadian hospitals had at least one painful procedure, and only 28% had a documented intervention. Um, I looked further at that data and found that over half of those procedures, 53% were related to needle, and sadly, only less than 10% had an intervention directly related to the needle. Next slide, please. So what we tried to do at Stollery was try to capture how many pokes we were actually doing here at the Stollery. So we polled our lab staff and looked at difficult IV starts and found that we were doing about 900 pokes a month. And that's on our 150 beds for the inpatients. So when we looked at combining that research and what we were able to pull, at least half of kids in our hospital have at least one needle every day. Next slide, please. So when we looked at how many pokes, we were then able to look at how many tubes of maxoline were being pulled from our Pixis in a month. And that proved that we really needed to revamp our policies. And so what we decided to do was um, we, we wrote a new protocol. And we wanted the protocol to be allowing our frontline staff, our RNs, and our licensed practical nurses to be able to put on maxoline without waiting for a dedicated order from a physician or a nurse practitioner. So we wrote the protocol, and we had it approved by the licensing bodies for both of those organizations here in the province. And we had it um, reviewed by the clinical policy consultants. And in April of 2014, we were able to get the policy approved that people could put this on without requiring a dedicated order. Next slide, please. So we then had to engage our staff. It wasn't good enough to just write a protocol. We had to engage our staff. So I took it to senior leadership, and it was crucial for them to say, Kathy, you need to fix this and give us the resources to be able to do this. We started with staff education through the managers and the clinical nurse educators that yes, you can put this on without requiring an order. 
We incorporated this into our orientation talk so that all new staff were aware that they could put Max Lean on without an order. We targeted the lab staff directly because most of those pokes were coming from the lab through their leadership and we talked about the importance of having that 30 minutes before you do the poke um, in order for the Max Lean to be effective. And of course we had to involve pharmacy throughout the process because it's for their budget that the, the um, Max Lean came out of. Next, staff, uh, next um, slide please. Again, we knew that wasn't enough to just target the staff. We really needed to empower the parents. And so our committee actually has family representatives on the pain committee. And we developed posters to help educate the parents about the importance of putting the Maxilene on prior to the pokes. You can see one of the samples there. But we did five different posters. And thanks to Dr. Samina Ali, who helped with the pictures, um, we had five different children on pictures, uh, reflecting some different cultures and different age diversity of a picture of a child with the Maxilene on on their arm and we put those up at each bedside um, throughout the stallery. We put them on every wall we could find, every door into the building and we put them in emergency as well so that parents knew they could ask for the numbing cream and that we wanted that numbing cream put on 30 minutes prior to ensure that it worked. Next slide please. So when we started the process, you can see that in February of 2014 when we did our audits, we had used a total of 90 tubes over 900 pokes, 90 tubes, so we knew we were not doing very well. We implemented the policy in April of 2014, we implemented the posters in the summer of 2014, and then we waited a few months because we wanted to make sure that it wasn't just the initial blip of a practice change, we wanted to see if it was sustained. So three or four months later we did another audit and we found a 216% increase in the use of MaxLane, which was huge. We were hoping for 100%. So as you can see we were using more of it. We're still not there all the way, but we were using more. We then decided to get a television interview with our local news station um, to again get the information into parents' hands and um, that was huge to have a parent come and talk about the importance of the cream. Um, that all of the resources that we used are available on the site, uh, on the CAFC um, um, site underneath the topical local anesthetics, including that interview. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Kathy, for doing that. Um, Jerry St. Jean does send her um, regrets um, because of this um, network issue. She's unable to call in, but she has um, granted me permission um, to speak to her slide, if that's all right. So Jerry is our clinical nurse educator um, at the emergency department at the Stollery Children's Hospital, and she recognized very early on that oral sucrose, um, that the knowledge base, uh, the evidence base was robust, and that she wanted to um, see it used more universally within our emergency department um, because a few years back it was dependent on a physician asking for it as an order or a nurse prompting a physician to ask for it as an order. It wasn't available to our nurses universally. Next slide please. So um, Jerry went through a number of steps. Now before I speak to them, I need to tell you Jerry is a very uh, special nurse educator in the sense that um, she's a wonderful person, easily approachable, and she's also on the ground all the time. So she is out of her office and on the floor. So the things I'm going to tell you she did will make sense if you understand that she is constantly present on the floor. So first thing was education. She knew that change was always difficult and that there were many reasons that staff might give her to not use the oral sucrose. So she went out there and walked around day evenings and asked them, why, why aren't you using oral sucrose? And she said she got three main uh, responses. One, she'll, um, uh, that children, they didn't think these infants really felt that much pain with these minor procedures. Um, they weren't sure that sucrose really worked and they thought it took too long and slowed down their process in accomplishing what they needed to do in terms of the procedure and moving the child's care forward. So um, Jerry took an approach uh, which was to address the reasons for, for um, their concerns um, one individual at a time. So she talked to them about the fact that infants do feel pain. She educated them about the flax scale um, in measuring the pain for these infants so that if they weren't sure if they actually applied this validated tool, they could actually quantify how much pain this child was actually demonstrating. 
um, to address the concerns about does it uh, really work. She explained the pathophysiology behind the use of sucrose, um, again, on a one-to-one, person-to-person basis. And she, um, the argument that it took too long, she just talked to them about satisfied par- families need less of the staff's time. So if they're happy and... and um, and content with how the process is going in the, and the flow is working in the emergency department, they're less likely to have more uh, queries, questions, and impatience. So using those three sort of educational strategies, she was able to um, address some of the educational or knowledge barriers that she encountered with, um, her, uh, with her staff. Um, then changing attitudes, and she says, you know, change is always difficult, um, although with education and knowledge, the staff started to see the benefits and in increased family satisfaction and subsequent presentations. So when the families came in again, for instance, they had a different approach to interacting with the healthcare team. So over time, over months, maybe even a year, the staff started to see that it was improving their relationship with the families by using the sucrose. In terms of champions in the department, Jerry found um, clinical, local clinical champions. So these are the leaders w- uh, with or without titles. So those people who were always the first to jump up and say, let's use sucrose, let's do something to help this infant with their pain. She found those people, armed them with the tools she had, and set them loose on our department. So she had a, um, an army, if you will, of people with this, uh, a small army, but an army yet still, of people who are willing to speak to the importance of uh, offering sucrose. Um, In terms of explaining the purpose of oral sucrose to the families, she this was, I think, very progressive and forward thinking as she was empowering the families to then ask for it for subsequent procedures or when they returned. And I've certainly anecdotally had that experience where once a family has used oral sucrose for an infant, the next time they come in, they will ask for it for a procedure. So she was empowering the families to take that information and come back to other settings to use it. And then, of course, being a role model, which in Jerry's case was easy because she's on the floor a lot. And um, those of you who who, uh, may not be familiar with Jerry might not know that she's our go-to person. Anytime someone cannot get an IV, we drag her out of her office and uh, make her come help us. So because she's on the floor so often, she was able to be that role model. And before she would do that difficult IV, for instance, on an infant, she would crack out the, the oral sucrose. And so, she, so her and her clinical champions were all modeling that behavior. And um, moving forward from this, this was pro- approximately about a year ago, we're now at a point where Jerry has been a key member of a team to now make oral sucrose a provincial policy throughout, um, to have a provincial, provincial policy on um, and procedure guideline for oral sucrose use throughout the entire province. So her scope is now expanding outside of our department uh, to the provincial level. And with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Ashley. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Samina. Um, So now we're going to go on to just um, four brief presentations about community collaborations, um, putting the work of the COP into practice on the front lines. Um, So as before, I'm going to be forwarding the slides and uh, we'll have a different speaker speak to each initiative. So first I'll invite Jen to speak to her commitment to comfort initiative. Good morning. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes, we are. Wonderful. Um, Can I get uh, the next slide, please? Wonderful. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share some of the work that we've been doing here in Calgary uh, to improve our children's uh, pain experience. And I'm going to be sharing with you work um, done by uh, myself and uh, my project co-lead, Antonia Stang. We're both pediatric emergency physicians here in Calgary. And uh, there wouldn't be time uh, to adequately thank our our entire team, but um, Erin Poles, our quality improvement nurse, has been really key to uh, making this project a success, um, as have been our child life specialists and many, many other people in our frontline staff. Um, Next slide, please. So um, our journey started about three years ago when several of us began wondering exactly how well we were managing pain in our patients. And we decided to start out by looking at limb injury since that represents about 12% of our ED visits and it's a condition that is commonly associated with pain. And we took a look at our electronic records to begin with and we saw that we weren't doing so great at documenting pain scores at triage. Of course, that didn't 
tell us whether or not we were assessing pain, but certainly, certainly the documentation was not good. And we saw that only 31% of kids who came to us with a limb injury ever received any analgesic medication during the course of their ED visit. That didn't tell us the proportion that wanted medication, but it certainly uh, seemed like it was uh, that we were under treating. And so in order to get a bit of an idea of what the patient experience was like, we also in those early days did a bit of a snapshot survey of 100 of our families, and we learned that about 18% said they would have wanted pain medication, but nobody offered it to them. And also 18% said that they were dissatisfied with the pain care that they received. And I'll just mention that we, we recognize that satisfaction isn't ever everything when it comes to, to pain care and that a satisfied family still might not have received adequate pain treatment, but we really felt like dissatisfaction with pain care was a problem that we wanted to address. Next slide. So once we understood where our quality gaps existed, we began working on an improvement strategy and we used quality improvement methods. So we developed some key aims and those included decreasing the proportion of patients who were not offered pain medicine down to zero. Um, and this, uh, this is our limb injury population. Uh, to increase the proportion of patients who received analgesic meds from 31% to 40%. And this was based on our surveys and our estimate of kids that we thought would actually want treatment for medication, taking into account that some actually receive medication before they arrive. And also to decrease the proportion of patients and parents who were dissatisfied with their pain care to 0%. And so we based our work on the model for improvement. And I'll just explain that briefly for those of you who haven't used it before. So essentially when um, you're doing quality improvement work, you start by asking yourself, what are we trying to accomplish? How will we know that changes that we make are actually resulting in improvement? And what changes can we make? Once you've asked those questions, you then embark on what's called plan, do, study, act, or PDSA cycles, meaning that you start with small tests of change. And as you learn about what works and what doesn't work, you can then make adjustments and scale up. Next slide. And so through a series of these PDSA cycles, um, during which we obtained a lot of feedback from staff, patients, and families, we arrived upon a concept that we call our commitment to comfort. And this says that we'll do our best to promote comfort by helping to lessen pain and anxiety. And to implement the commitment, um, we developed a change man management strategy to promote interest and goodwill toward the project. And this even included fun things like a staff com comfort week. Um, we did have a bit of project funding and we used a bit of that funding to get pizzas. Um, we put up posters and when people came to get their uh, pizza, they read about our posters. And we even had on a few shifts, um, chair massages. And so people would come to get a chair massage to promote the idea of comfort being important to everyone. And when they were lined up for their chair massage, they would read our material. So that, that worked out actually pretty well. Um, we then, um, using the PDSA cycles, we developed a set of interventions. And I'll share um, some of those interventions with you on the uh, next couple slides. So the next slide. So starting on the left, you can see um, a poster. And we, we displayed these posters in all of our triage spaces and all of our patient care spaces. And the, um, the posters are um, meant to empower families to start conversations and also to bring about culture change. And I'll just point out a couple of the things on the poster. The stoplight pain scale was developed um, by Amy Drendel, who's a pediatric emergency physician in Milwaukee, and the Stollery is currently doing some validation work on that stoplight pain scale. We found that it's a wonderful graphic to draw attention and to be able to start those conversations um, and to, um, to really uh, be able to um, initiate in a child-friendly way that discussion of, of how the child is feeling and, and uh, what type of pain they may ex be experiencing. Another thing that our families really liked on this poster is the comfort menu. And perhaps it's a um, little bit small in this slide, but we presented this idea to patients and they said, 
we love it, please put it on all of the walls. They wanted to know what was available so that they could ask for it. So you can see um, numbing cream before needles um, is one of the things, um, ice packs. They didn't necessarily know that these things were available and so when they knew that it was there, then it made it easier to ask. Um, moving clockwise around that uh, slide, um, you see um, at the top is a button um, that was an awareness raiser um, for the commitment to comfort. On the right is a pamphlet. Um, uh, that's uh, an example of our uh, patient family education. We also had staff education materials and there's an electronic version that's available on the website that's listed below. Um, and then uh, bottom center is one of our comfort kits and that we have a comfort kit in each of our care pods in the ED, so about five total, and uh, those contain our distraction items. Next slide. So uh, next you will see a um, an example of a uh, comfort position poster, which we borrowed from the Stollery. Um, on the top right is a tablet that we have in our comfort kits. On the bottom right, one of our t-shirts, again, to promote awareness. And on the bottom left, this is a bookmark-sized pain scale. And on the back of it is the um, FACES revised pain scale, also with a numerical pain scale. And these are... Uh, these are bookmark sized and they're available at our triage desks and our patient care spaces so kids can have their own individual pain scale um, to be able to describe their pain and in addition as staff when we see that it's a little bit of a visual trigger to remind us to ask about pain. Uh, next slide. So. Throughout the duration of our project, we looked both at our electronic data and we also enrolled a cohort of over 900 patients who told us about their pain experience from their time of arrival until three days after discharge. And um, uh, this is a control chart, um, which is a uh, the way QI measures are often displayed. And uh, looking at the proportion of kids who received pain medication, and um, as you can see, as new interventions were introduced, we did see improvements. Um, and uh, actually, we met and exceeded our initial aim, going from 31% up to now 44% of kids with limb injuries who are getting analgesic medications. And we do believe that this um, comes pretty close to the the total number who want to have medication from us. Um, we also saw improvements in time to analgesia and dissatisfaction has gone from 18% now down to 8%. Next slide. And so at this stage, we are now spreading our work to all of the emergency departments in Calgary that see kids, as well as our urgent care centers. So these are general emergency departments that see both adults and kids. And we're doing this through a quality improvement collaborative, where each site has its own project team, and they're um, using this our this toolkit to develop their own aims and implementation strategies and I'm happy to share that uh, just a couple months into the project now some of the sites are already starting to see progress toward their aims which is very exciting and also we are applying um, for CIHR funding to spread some of this work uh, and the idea of a uh, QI collaborative to pediatric emergency departments in several of the other provinces through the um, Pediatric Emergency Research Canada PERC network. Um, so um, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share our work. Hello. Hello. Hello, hi. Hello I'm Evelyn Trotty from uh, St. Jason. I guess I'm the next person to speak. So I'm a pediatric emergency physician in uh, St. Justin in Montreal, and I'm very happy to talk to you about our TRAP2 project, which stated for treating and reducing anxiety and pain in the pediatric emergency department. It was a project mainly about pain management strategy and production in the different PEDs in Canada. And this project was done in collaboration with Dr. Saminati and 15 other co collaborators from the PERC, which is the Pediatric Emergency Research Canada. Can I have the next uh, slide, please? So in uh, uh, 2013, we did the first TRAP-1 survey, uh, which showed that uh, the 15 pediatric emergency department in Canada had many strategies available for pain and distress management, but also uh, needed a lot of improvement. So we wanted to take a step 
further and stimulate the introduction of new strategy in individual center through a pain quality improvement collaborative, which I uh, will actually call the pain kick. So uh, after contacting those 15 uh, ED, uh, 11 pediatric ED agreed to participate to this pain kick. And uh, mainly we shared information, guidelines, uh, policies through in-person meetings, telephone meetings, general and personal emails, and also through a follow-up survey uh, through the year in 2015. So at the end of the project, we decided to reconduct the TRAP-1 uh, survey for It's my pleasure to actually talk about PERC. Um, uh, next slide, please. So PERC is, uh, stands for the Pediatric Emergency Research Canada, affectionately known as PERC. And what it, PERC is, is uh, it was mentioned before by Jennifer, it's a network of uh, researchers across the 15 academic children's hospitals. It was founded more than 10 years ago. It includes more than 200 members, and these are from varied disciplines. Uh, um, so nurses, clinical research coordinators, uh, trainees, including medical students, residents, and fellows, uh, qualitative researchers as well, and physicians. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, as many of you know, it's very difficult to do, in some cases, to do research in children because of small sample sizes. We just don't have the same sample sizes that the you know large adult trials have. But one of our actually Perk's overarching mandate um, is to bring together researchers uh, who are like-minded and to facilitate multi-centered collaboration. By pooling research expertise, uh, they also do a very good job of mentoring new investigators like myself in project development. And very importantly, they endorse a lot of new protocols. And protocol endorsement is very important for um, uh, attaining grants. Now, in recognition for PERC's excellent work in bringing together uh, pediatric researchers, uh, PERC was awarded the Top Achievements in Health Research Award. Next slide, please. One of the uh, benefits of PERC uh, is that, as I said, it does bring together people uh, with similar research interests. And in 2014, uh, Dr. Samina Ali and myself uh, formed the PERC Pain Interest Group, affectionately known as the PIG. And our goal was to encourage uh, high quality pain management research uh, in keeping with the overarching mandate of PERC. So multi-center, cross-discipline collaboration, uh, mentorship of uh, trainees, and particularly sharing expertise and, uh, and resources. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the fruits of our collaboration include the trapped uh, survey that Evelyn Trottier was uh, talking about. And this is essentially a cross-sectional survey of PERC centers. And I can speak to a little bit about this. But the overarching uh, uh, goal of, uh, of the trap survey was to determine the availability of procedures for pain and anxiety management uh, in children across uh, emergency departments. Next slide, please. Two of the uh, new projects uh, that the uh, or reflect uh, the PIG collaborative efforts is, uh, is determining the best uh, combination therapy for children with fractures at triage. As most of you know, there really is uh, no good uh, consensus as to the best therapy, and uh, Dr. Sylvie LeMay is looking at this uh, answer, and hopefully this trial will start uh, very soon. It is planned to start very soon. Next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Uh, Antonio Stang is putting together uh, uh, a study called the Pain QIC, which is a multi-centered quality improvement uh, collaboration. And again, this is also based on the knowledge to action cycle. And the goal here is to identify barriers of pain management uh, and pain assessment and essentially produce a quality improvement uh, initiative for families and healthcare providers. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to the next speaker. Thanks, Naveen. Um, and the next speaker is me, Ashley. I'm back. Um, and I'm just going to speak to one more community collaboration um, before we do a bit of wrap-up and have time for questions. 
So right now I'm going to speak about an exciting partnership um, that's getting started between the Payne COP and a group called Trek. So to create a broader reach for the toolkits, CAPC has been working with Trek to cross post or house our Payne toolkits on their website as well. Now Trek stands for Translating Emergency Knowledge for Kids and it is a growing network of researchers, clinicians, national organizations and health consumers who share the same goal to improve emergency care for children across Canada. TREC is known as a knowledge mobilization initi initiative. This means that they want to transform the speed at which the latest evidence in children's emergency care is used in everyday EDs, remote, rural, or urban. So by partnering them up with them, we open um, up ourselves and the toolkits to an audience that we may not have otherwise had access to. Um, and the toolkit should be up on their website shortly. So the last slide that I'll speak to um, is where we're at now and our future directions for the Payne COP. In future, we hope to be able to share more details, um, but we have um, put in an abstract for the upcoming CAPC conference on October 23rd to the 25th um, that will speak more to you about the details about the Payne COP and the development of the toolkit. Um, as I've mentioned, we've developed a knowledge translation plan that focuses on an active dissemination of the toolkits across Canada. So please stay tuned and keep your eyes peeled for us on social media or on your listserv or in your inbox. Having said that, we are looking for champions to spread the word about this work. So if at the end of this presentation today you could see yourself using these toolkits and it would and you would like to support the Payne COP, please let us know. We know we are, everybody is busy. It, it, it takes um, a little bit of time, but not too much time, and um, really it would help to support uh, kids' acute procedural pain. So on to our new project. The work of a Payne COP is never done. We, are, we, are, we will be embarking on a new project in the fall, and in our upcoming August meeting, um, we will be discussing new ideas for the next project. So in the meantime, you're welcome to contact us with your ideas, your hot topics, your burning issues about pediatric pain um, at the email we've listed below, or um, if you contact CAPC and you can join us for our call in August and get in on that pain COP meeting. And with that, that is the end of our um, webinar today. We want to thank everybody for joining us. We know you have um, many competing priorities and uh, that this was a priority for you means a lot to us and for children's acute procedural pain. So at this time, we'll be taking questions um, and I'm going to turn it back over to CAPC to field those questions and then um, our panelists and experts on the line can help to answer those. All right. Well, we won't be fielding any questions. We'll just be introducing them to our experts across the country here to do the fielding of those questions. Um, but th what a great presentation. I mean, I, we were a little worried about nine presenters and how we were going to get through it. And you guys did a fantastic job of really giving some really great sort of uh, snippets of, of the great work that's happening and a lot of that great work has already been presented at other places uh, on the CAFC Presents webinar and elsewhere. Uh, Ashley and your team at Holland Blurview did a presentation, a full presentation on the pain toolkit that they developed for children with disabilities that you can find on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, Kathy and her team years ago, the stories from the floor about implementing uh, pain practices, etc. That's going back a few years but that's also on the Knowledge Exchange Network. So in addition to the, the work of the community of practice and the, and the toolkit that's being presented today, Lots of other more detailed information on many of those components uh, available on the Knowledge Exchange Network. So don't uh, don't hesitate to uh, do do some searching and look around for some of that great work that's already there. Um, the first question that came in uh, uh, was from Sarah, and she's asking uh, for you, Ashley, uh, since we've got you on the on the microphone here. Uh, she wants to ask you about the online peer support at Blorview. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Oh, sure. Um, that's awesome. I'm so happy someone's asking about it, although it's completely unrelated to pain. Um, so it is a um, toolkit that we developed um, to support people that develop peer support programs for parents who have children with medical complexity or other lifelong disabilities. Um, so what I can do now is I can type into um, the little chat box the, e uh, the, the website link for it, and you can access it there and it's free to download and you can check it out um, and on the website where, where um, you'll find it. If you have any questions, there's also the evidence to care email and you're welcome to email us directly about it. 
And that also featured on a presentation on the CAPC Presents webinar series probably about a month ago. I think uh, we, we did that one with you guys, maybe a little bit more than a month. But again, if uh, the, the link to the toolkit is there on the on the Knowledge Exchange Network, we'll get it into the chat box here. But if you want to hear uh, the, the team at Holland Blur View um, presenting in detail that whole uh, peer support program, uh, that's also available on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Um, so again, this is my chance to remind the audience, type your questions in if you do have them. We do have a, uh, just a couple more minutes left. We're getting pretty close to the end of our time, but we certainly can take a few more questions. Um, and uh, also to remind uh, anyone in the audience, if you are interested in getting more involved in the community of practice, please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, as you can see, the, the one of the benefits of the community of practice is really the knowledge translation piece. I mean, this was one group, as we've said throughout this presentation, that the knowledge, the evidence was, was already there and was very robust. And really what we need is to support the knowledge translation of this and get it into practice. And that's really a lot of the work of the community of practice is uh, sharing those stories and those ideas of how you get this evidence to practice, so don't hesitate to contact us if you'd like a little more uh, information. Um, so yeah, we don't have a lot of questions coming in at this point. We've got a quiet audience today, um, possibly due to the great presentations and all the detail that we've given. People are perhaps uh, uh, browsing through the information on the on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, but we'll give people another few minutes to uh, to type some questions in if they have them, and uh, perhaps we'll able to wrap up a little early. All right, so maybe we will, uh, maybe we'll, oh, sorry, uh, we do have a question that just came in. Uh, Francesca has uh, asked, do other hospitals have access to the toolkits? And uh, I think the answer, of course, is, is yes. We do have the link to the toolkit in the chat box, so you're welcome to browse through any of the, the resources that are there. Um, and then uh, Morgan is asking, is there any plans for community-based practice to assist in preparing children for these procedures? Uh, Sabina, uh, maybe we could start with you on that one. Uh, is there any, any, anything that you're aware of, of uh, from support in the community for children who, are, who know they're going for a painful procedure and perhaps can access support beforehand uh, to prepare themselves for any pain that might be associated with the procedure that they're uh, going in for? Thank you for that question. Um, I th my understanding is the community-based resources that might be out there are generally linked to specific programs. So for instance, if your child um, is having um, a surgical day procedure when you come to pre-op pre clinic at the children's hospital, they would send you home with literature for uh, to anticipate what you could do or might do. Um, to my knowledge, there is no community-based um, resource or web-based resource that is out there meant for children to go to before they have a specific procedure that is um, used uh, broadly across Canada. Um, I would suggest, however, to our colleague who put forth that question that the CAFC tool kits that we've created here would actually have some of the resources you might be able to use for that where um, you might be able to um, provide them with a link to a video that shows, for instance, one of our toolkits has a box around what to do when a child is getting an IV or blood work. You might be able to show them that video. Some of the, the toolkits have parent handouts that you might be able to use as well. So please do take an opportunity to browse the toolkits afterwards with that link that was provided to all attendees. You might find some resources there. Um, if anyone else knows of national resources, please do speak, but I'm not aware of any that are not specifically hospital and program-based. All right, thank you. And uh, Jennifer, uh, part of one of our panelists, who you heard earlier, is also saying uh, that you're welcome to contact her uh, at Alberta Children's Hospital, and she'd be welcome or happy to share their resources as well. Any of the other panelists have anything to add to that one? Okay. Um, uh, so we're just wondering, uh, we also had a question wondering about uh, supporting practitioners to feel comfortable using uh, breastfeeding and skin-to-skin -skin, uh, in infants. I know that uh, from our community of practice, it's uh, uh, Denise Harrison from CHEO is, uh, is one of the people who often leads that work, and she, again, has also done presentations in the past on the Knowledge Exchange Network about that. But anyone on the panel want to uh, tackle that as far as any any tips on, on supporting practitioners to become more comfortable in recommending breastfeeding and skin-to-skin -skin in infants to, to manage pain? Uh, 
Hi, it's Jennifer. Um, I'll say what we've done at Alberta Children's and in our, our Calgary Emergency Departments is we've included the photos of infants being breastfed during procedures as part of the comfort positions posters. And so I think that helps in giving staff an idea of exactly what that looks like because otherwise they might be a little bit confused thinking well how am I going to be able to access the child during the procedure um, and then I think having a few local champions is really helpful as well so um, sometimes a, a couple of us who have an interest in this area will support um, the team as they're as they're giving it a try will just say hey would you be willing to give this a try for this baby and quite often they have a very positive experience and are then able to share that with their colleagues and, and spread the word and it grows from there so um, we have uh, been able to implement that at ACH and I, I think it's through um, making staff comfortable both through awareness and education but then having those local champions Thank you, Jennifer. That's great, uh, great input. Um, we do have a, a number of people asking about uh, access to the slides and, and recordings of the presentation, people who missed the beginning, and absolutely, if you missed the beginning, you wouldn't have heard me say that uh, we do post all of this information uh, on the Knowledge Exchange Network, including a full recording, and you can also download the, the, uh, the PowerPoint slides right from the control panel. There should be a link right in the control panel that would allow you to download the PowerPoint slides. Um, we also had a couple of questions about people accessing uh, the pain scales, the documents, and other things. And again, all of that stuff is on the uh, the Knowledge Exchange Network in the pain assessment uh, or the acute procedural pain toolkit. And all, and all, all that information is there. You're welcome to download it and use it and modify it as you uh, as you need to make it relevant to your own organization. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have a question, and maybe we'll put this one to uh, uh, Samina as one of the chairs. We'll give you a little heads up that this question is coming your way. Sarah's asking about sustainability and how how will we keep these resources up to date? What's the plan as far as going forward with that and maintaining um, this toolkit? Yeah, thank you. Um, great question. I can tell you even from two months ago or a month ago when we posted our initial content through our community of practice meetings, we've already updated it. So the the community of practice's work is never done in the words of our, uh, of our um, co-chair, Ashley. Um, so I think we will continuously be working. It's an iterative process. I, I would, I'm speaking for CAFC, but I think I'm not mistaken in saying that at any point if someone suggested um, to them that there was other content or information they'd like to see posted, um, that uh, they would, we would vet it as a COP and then it would be put up onto the, um, updated on the way, on the, uh, in the toolkits as well. Our COP is committed to a number of more uh, years of work, I imagine, <laughs> just to get through our original agenda of acute pain, chronic pain, and this procedural pain. So you certainly have that infrastructure there. The other thing CAFC has w wisely done is that they've uh, reached out to other national net networks that care about this area as well. So um, much of what we are doing is being paralleled and or, and or shared with other organizations such as TREK, um, which is um, TREK, T-R-E-K-K.ca, um, and um, they are, have a commitment and a financial infrastructure as well to continue to update their content and where our content is now linked to theirs and we're sharing one another's work. I can foresee that with that infrastructure as well as the fact that many of the players overlap and work at both work with both institutions or both organizations that will continue to update this information. Absolutely, we don't want this to be a uh, a circa 2016 repository that then withers and dies. We want it to stay um, a living um, resource that is constantly being um, renewed. Thank you. And uh, you also noticed that uh, Dr. Trache has shared a link to resources from uh, St. Justin, uh, the Children's Hospital in Montreal. Dr. Trache, perhaps we can try and hear you now if you wanted to try, uh, unmute yourself there. If you wanted to just give a, a bit of a description of what people can find there. Yes, we did a, a guideline for our emergency uh, about uh, pain management for a simple procedure. So I simply share one of, of our links about that. And there's a, a little video for the parents as well to, uh, uh, to prepare their children pre uh, before a, a minor procedure. Um, yeah. Much. So we are just about out of time. Uh, we don't have any last-minute questions coming into the question box, so maybe this is a good time to uh, 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 wrap up. And maybe we do have a large panel, so maybe we won't, we won't hear any final comments from 
uh, everyone, but maybe uh, Dr. Ellie and Ashley, maybe maybe as the as the co-chairs of this work, uh, maybe we can just hear from you some just some closing comments, any any key messages you'd like to send the audience off with. Um, it's Ashley. I can go first. Um, I guess just my closing arguments would be to say thank you for everybody to everybody for joining us today. It's been really exciting to go through this process and to see so many champions and people who are really interested in um, pediatric pain come together and create this resource. Um, and I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing what we can do through the CAPC platform and um, getting this out more widely across Canada. Thank you, Ashley. And I would add to that, uh, this is Samina, I would add to that uh, to, again, thank you for your time and your uh, commitment to, to hearing what we have done so far and know that this is your community. So any and every individual on this call, if this uh, reached out to you, you found this interesting, it intrigued you, or you thought, hey, I can do this better, or I have some ideas that were not addressed, please reach out to us through CAFC and join our community of practice. The larger it gets, the more impactful we can be. So thank you again for your time. All right, and thank you very much. Thanks again for uh, to the to the panel with the, the the size of the panel. You guys did such a fantastic job of really interacting and, and sharing the stage and bringing bringing what was really a wealth of information into a relatively short period of time. So so thanks for such a great presentation. Uh, Carl put into the question box. He says thanks very much. The presentations were a breath of fresh air and a great support for our efforts to prevent and reduce children's pain. And I couldn't have said it better myself. So thanks, Carl, for that comment. Um, so with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Uh, thanks again to the audience uh, for joining us today. We do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and you can watch, uh, uh, it's great when you can watch live as you can ask these questions and really drive the discussion. Uh, but when you can't watch live, we do, as I mentioned, record the entire presentation, uh, and uh, we'll make that available on the Knowledge Exchange uh, Network after the fact. As I mentioned also, it does take a couple of days to get that information up, along with uh, the, the PowerPoint slides uh, and, and any other information that uh, our presenters have shared with us. And we'll also, of course, be putting links to uh, make sure we can get you uh, quickly to the uh, pain toolkit on the Ken as well um, to make sure you can find that easily. Um, next week, we'll, we're going to hear about the interplay between culture and care, building capacity to care for Aboriginal children and youth. And this session might be of particular interest to folks participating today as we will have two presenters uh, talk about how Aboriginal children experience health issues and health care differently from other children in Canada. Uh, and, but we'll, uh, of particular interest to today's group, but we'll be hearing from Dr. Margot Latimer and John Silliboy, who will talk about the Aboriginal Children's Hurt and Healing Initiative, and that will be about how uh, the objectives of that program in identifying important pain-related health inequities that could be further impairing children's well-being. And then we'll also hear from Dr. Roberta Woodgate uh, from Winnipeg during that session, who will share findings from a CIHR-funded study that sought to arrive at an increased understanding of the disability trajectory from the perspectives of First Nations families of children with disabilities. So that's going to be a great session. Uh, both uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Latimer and uh, Woodgate, uh, familiar to our CAFC Presents audience uh, from presenting with, our, with us before. And then on July 6th, we'll hear uh, from, we'll be welcoming back uh, again another familiar face, uh, Dr. Jonathan Weiss, uh, the Canada Research Chair in Autism Spectrum Disorder Treatment and Care. And he's going to be talking about mental health problems in youth with developmental disabilities, foundations of assessment and intervention. And the workshop is going to review what we know about emotional and behavioral problems in youth with developmental mental disabilities, along with what the research tells us about the reasons these youth are at greater risk than their typically developing peers. It will re we, will, we will review best practices from assessment to evidence-based interventions for mental health within a positive youth development framework. So some great uh, sessions coming up in the next couple weeks, uh, certainly relevant to the audience uh, that participated today. So we hope, uh, thanks again for joining us today, and we hope to see you back here next week. Bye, everyone.